very much for being here. Today, our speaker of the Lugano Philosophy Colloquia is our own Leon Cops, and he will present some part of his research on golden numberings. So today's talk is what is a good golden numbering, as you can see there. There is a time <laughs> in the first slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so it, it is part of my research and it's quite an ongoing research. And um, the aim of today's presentation was to show, to present a bit more the philosophical part of, of this research. So that's uh, what I will try to do today. Uh, Oh, yes. Okay, so here's the outline of the talk. So I will briefly start by introducing um, some notion that uh, we're going to need. So metamathematics meta meta and its intentionality. Then I will briefly go through what is a good numbering and give you a few examples of those. And then I'm going to talk about the intentionality of numbering, the numberings with the aim to um, to try to answer the question of is a good uh, Euler numbering. All right, so let's first start by considering the liar paradox. So we can start with the sentence, the liar sentence, which is the liar is not the liar is not true. And one particular theory of this sentence is because this sentence the liar, and so the liar says of itself basically that it is not true. And then we can try to derive the liar paradox. So one usual way to uh, derive the contradiction from that is the following one. So we start by, by seeing that the liar is true if and only if the liar is not true, is true. And we call this, the liar just name the sentence, the liar is not true. Then we have this second line. The liar is not true, is true, if and only if the liar is true, is not true. Then we can have the liar is true, is not true, if and only if the liar is not true. And together we get the contradiction, the liar is true, if and only if the liar is not true, which is a flat contradiction. So it's a bit tricky to understand why the second line holds and why the third line holds as well. And <clears throat> the easiest way to see why it holds is to realize that this line is an instance of a much more general principle with respect to truth and negation. So we can start by seeing this principle, which is just that the negation of a certain sentence is true if and only if the sentence itself is not true. And in the second line, we have the negation of the sentence, the liar, the liar is true. So the negation of that sentence is the liar is not true. And the rest follows uh, as an instance of this much more general principle that take care of the relation between the negation. For the third line, well, we again have another principle which says that a sentence of the form T is true is true if and only if T denotes a sentence that is itself true. Again, this principle I think is relatively quite um, intuitive, and we can see that here um, the third line of uh, this informal argument is just again an instance of um, the discuss this quotation principle. So the principle that takes care of the the, the relationship between truth and uh, quotation. And here, um, yeah, the third line is just that with T being the liar and a negation on both way of view, uh, if and only. So now we might ask whether this argument is valid, whether it makes sense actually to, 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 to say that from the liar paradox and those two principles, we can derive a contradiction. And one way to answer this question is to try to give a formalization of this argument. And to formalize this argument, uh, we will have to make a bunch of choices. And especially we'll have to make non-mathematical choices. We, for example, have to pick a certain language in which we want to formalize this argument. We also have to pick a theory in which we want to prove the contradiction formally, and so forth and so forth. And to jump a bit ahead, um, one consequence is that 
the the whether this the formalization of this algorithm, whether we get a contradiction or not, really crucially depends on the choice that we made with respect to the number. All right. So what do we do when we try to formalize those kind of arguments? So the field that deal with those kind of formalizations, so arguments which we talks about notion as truth, quotation, or those very mathematical notion is called the field of metamathematics. And it is roughly uh, the study of mathematics itself using mathematical methods. And so in those in, in this field we are concerned with formal argument dealing with mathematical theories and also mathematical notions, such as the this quotation notion or the notion of truth. And so to formalize the larger um, paradox, the first step is to formalize those two principles about truth. So the negation principle and the quotation principle. And we can relatively easily formalize them as such. That T is the truth predicate. And then we have the little quine's uh, corner to say the name of the certain formula, which is inside that. And if you look at the, the formalization here, it's quite straightforward to have a um, that this formalization is the correct formalization of the two uh, principles that we saw before. But now, how can we basically have a name for certain formula? And how can we deal with names of certain expression? And to have names of sentences, basically, it is required to have a language which is strong enough to be able to talk about its sentences. And or even better, it is required to have a language which is strong enough to talk about itself. So how it is made and so forth and so on. And the very natural choice for such a language is the language of arithmetic. And we will use actually numbers to encode certain syntactic expression of the language so that we can reason about the numbers and interpret what we reason about the numbers to be um, results about the, lang the language itself. So this very important process is called the process of arithmetization. And it is the idea of coding certain syntactic aspect of the logic using numbers. Typically, we will associate some expression of the language to numbers and some property of the language to properties of numbers. And so the basic idea is that instead of reasoning directly about the expression or the syntactic aspect of the logic, we're going to reason through the numbers and through results about the numbers. And in the end, we're going we're gonna to interpret those results about the numbers to be results about the language. And this is the very core idea of the arithmetization of the syntax. So once We've done that, we can finally formalize the Lyell uh, paradox and the argument I just outlined uh, before. And so we can take, choose a theory of arithmetic strong enough with a powerful enough language. So for example, Yale here that formalize the Lyell sentence. We can add those two principles just there and we can check whether this theory is consistent or not. And the maybe surprising result is that this theory, whether it's consistent or not, depends on the choice of the number. So it depends on the choice of, on, on, on mathematical choice parameter. More generally, it depends on how you arithmetize the syntax. And this is even worse or maybe good for some people is that this phenomenon is not restricted to that particular theory. Any or most results in metamathematics depends at some, in some degrees on the way, on the exact precise way that we arithmetize the syntax. And this is extremely important because we have some very important results in metamathematics uh, that are, for example, used in philosophy. I'm thinking of on the finality of truth or even more uh, important
Norton Gill's second incompleteness theorem. And we would like that those results uh, do not depend on the precise way we encode things, basically. So there is this important in philosophy to have philosophical interpretation of those results. Um, and so to know exactly what we can, how we can arithmetize the syntax, to know under which condition those results fall. And there is also the math uh, more mathematical um, importance to know uh, how those results depend on the arithmetization of the syntax. And that is because we want to generalize those results to a number of different theory, to a number of different um, mathematical objects, and so forth and so on. And we want also to know the precise limitation of those uh, results. For example, we might want to know whether the Lyer paradox applies to a certain context or not. And this question, as you see, might directly depend on how we arithmetize the syntax. So what is this? Why is it depending on, on that? Well, we call this phenomenon the phenomenon of intentionality of metamathematics. And it was first introduced by Pfeffermann in a very famous um, article there. But roughly, the process we mean by intentionality of metamathematics, uh, that the process of arithmetization, so coding things to prove things in the end, to prove things about what we code. Um, so the process of arithmetization has to be in the right way, in a sense that we have to motivate and to argue which on mathematical choice we can uh, do and the one we cannot do. So we have to argue which are the good choice and the bad choices in the process of arithmetization. So Pfefferman introduces the principle as follows. So the application of the method of arithmetization can be classified as intentional if the definition must more fully express the notion involved so that values of the general properties of these notions can be formally derived. So, of course, it is not so clear so far, and this is far from being any mathematical definition that we can use. But um, let me first stress that in this context, Fulton thinks really of only properties. So in notion here, he has very the probability predicate or truth predicate, those, those kind of objects. And right now we are way more, um, uh, we accept, we, we say that many more other notions are intentional. And actually we, we even say that the base theory might, might be intentional, the numbering is intentional, the probability predicate, the truth predicate, but also consistency center and so forth and so on. So the notion of, the notion here that we are dealing with right now are way more, um, large than what Pfefferman had in mind. But what, so to explain a bit uh, the, 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 the basic idea behind Pfefferman's uh, quotation and the very core, I think, very intuitive insights of the intentionality of a correct, of, of a correct, of an intentionally correct arithmetization is that the the definition that we are providing must somehow represent, uh, re oh, sorry, resembles the notion. So if you want to talk about uh, probability, probability in a theory, you introduce an arithmetized probability predicate, and you have to have some kind of resemblance between the arithmetized probability predicate and the very notion, the very mathematical notion in a degree, so the probability. Other example, you have the notion of truth, you arithmetize the notion of truth, and you have to have some kind of links between the arithmetized notion of truth or definition of truth and the notion of truth. And the link has to be that those two notions have to resemble each other. So I will not argue here, but that's, I think, what Fetchman had in mind when he said, must more fully express. The other part is that the various, uh, so that various of the general properties of this notion can be formally derived. Again, if you talk, if you think about probability, 
we know that true variability, for example, is closed on the remote exponents. And so the arithmetized version of true variability, you should be derived, you should be able to derive some kind of mode exponents equivalence for the arithmetized version of true variability. But this is still a bit imprecise and we can do a bit better. <laughs> and that's the two attempts that we can find in the literature, the resemblance criterion and the mean postulate. So what does the resemblance criterion say? Again, very, very intuitive when you do actually the arithmetization, it's very intuitive and you pretty much or always know uh, whether your arithmetized formula resembles the notion that you are trying to arithmetize. So phi is an intentionally correct arithmetization of A, where A is can be any notion. But again, in this case, we think it's, it might be easier to think of A as a property, like the property of being provable, the property of being true, so forth. on. If and only phi resembles the definition of A, so the definition of probability or the definition of true in the relevant way. So, of course, here you have two main difficulties. The first one is what do we mean by resemblance here? And the second one, the second one is what are the relevant ways? By resemblance, you can find somewhere in the literature that phi should have maybe almost the same structure as A. So you should have some kind of the, the arithmetized predicate must somehow resemble this, well, must have somehow have the same structure than the definition of probability in the, in the normal mathematical understanding of it. But it is actually extremely difficult to make it more precise and to say what is it to have the same structure as a definition. And the second difficulty is there what is the relevant way? And that might depend on which notion we're talking about. And it's even worse if we want to take into account some the correct arithmetization of numbers or things like that. So although this principle is very intuitive from an uh, intuitive point of view, it is not, well, we cannot do much with it. And so people try to come up with another notion of being intentionally correct, and it is the meaning postulate. So phi is an intentionally correct arithmetization of A, if and only if T, which is a theory, proves all meaning postulates of A or phi. So what does it mean here is that instead of trying to get this thing with resembles, we're going to just set some condition uh, that a certain structure, uh, a certain formula must have. Again, for example, if phi is a probability predicate, we just fix some condition that a probability that you should be able to derive for phi to be a probability uh, predicate. So easy example uh, are the Lobs condition for probability predicates. And so what we have is that if for, for phi, for probability predicate to be an intentionally correct arithmetization of the notion of probability, T, so your theory you are working on, must prove the Lobs condition for this probability predicate. If it does, then uh, phi, is, phi is going to be an intentionally correct arithmetization of the notion of probability. Again, this is very nice, actually, because it allows us to prove things mathematically. So it's very pr practical because I just have to set up a bunch of conditions. For example, again, the Lobs condition, and then I can go on proving my results under the assumption of those conditions. And I can even prove them for certain predicates. And so I have some kind of unbiased results with respect to formulas that respect those very precise conditions. The main issue is that we still need to argue for the relevance of those conditions, and that's very not easy. And even worse, we, here we want to capture the intentionally correct arithmetization, so not the minimum condition to prove certain results, 
we won't really fight to really mean the notion of uh, the Fairfax architecture A here. So we must somehow find necessary and sufficient condition to put them into the, well, as meaning postulates. And this is, again, an extremely difficult task. And um, yeah. Okay. So there you have the two different way that one might try to capture uh, to, to, to understand when a certain predicate, certain formula is intention is an intentionally correct characterization of a certain notion, mathematical notion. And there will be a lot more to say on this um, on this part, but uh, I won't go more into into details there. I just want to point out that the usual story really among logicians is that the resemblance criterion is extremely intuitive. So we want to have that, but it's very difficult to make precise and not very practical to prove things. So we're just not going to use that, and we're going to switch to the meaning principle that is a bit less relevant, but we can still um, prove our theorems. And maybe in a certain time, we're going to try to argue for the relevance of the meaning postulates that we have uh, assumed. Uh, but it's it doesn't really matter if uh, uh, we don't do the last part because, again, we prove the theorem, so we already got an interesting result. So in my situation, I will disagree with this uh, usual story. And I will try actually to argue that both of those uh, definitions are absolutely needed to have a correct in, uh, intentional uh, intentionally correct arithmization of these notions. And if you recall Pfefferman quotes, those two notions were not opposed. It was just the first one and then so that we can prove the second one. And so we completely agree with that. And I will try for the rest of the quote to show that both of those notions are needed, at least in the case to have intentionally correct numberings. So, and then, yeah, from there, I will finally try to answer the question, what is a good Gödel number? Okay, so what is a number, a Gödel number or simply a number? Well, as I said before, we want to arithmetize the syntax, which is to try to reason about numbers instead of reasoning about expression, but then to interpret our reasoning about numbers to be in an indirect way reasoning about the expression or syntactic aspect of the image. And so the numbering is very the first step in the in this arithmetization process because it's going to be the link between the expression of a language and the numbers. So we can give, oh yeah. So here is a quote by Peter Smith on his nice book. And Peter Smith says that a numbering will correlate various syntactic properties with purely numerical properties. In a phrase, a numbering arithmetizes the syntax. So really, the numbering is the bridge between the language and the numbers. And then all the rest of the arithmetization is done purely on the numbers. So this is a very uh, large definition of what is a numbering. So numbering is just an injective function from the expression of a language into the natural numbers. And the function we just do the bridge and we just impose the condition that this function must be injective. Okay, so here is an example. So let's take, for example, the language of arithmetic which is this very poor language with only a few symbols. And we say that the expression of that language are, oops, are all the finite strings composed by those symbols. So for example, 00s with an expression of a language and plus equal 
uh, Vs will be another expression for language and so forth. And I call this uh, A star, the clean uh, closure on that language. And so a numbering on the, for that language is just a rejected function from this set, the set of all finite string from that language, from that alphabet, sorry, into the natural number. Okay, so now let's see a couple of examples of numbers. So what does omega stand for? Sorry? Omega, what does it stand for? Uh, the natural numbers. Ah. Okay. So first example of numbering, the standard numbering, which you can find in, for example, already in uh, Gödel's famous article on incompleteness. Um, so the first step to set up the standard Numbering is to fix the basic codes of the symbols of our language. So we're going to associate to each symbol of our language a certain natural number. And so we can go to the second step, which is that for a given expression of our language, so any expression in A star, the set of all finite string from those symbols, the expression will be the concatenation of n many symbols of the language. And so we're going to give the code to that expression the number which is equal to two power, the basic code of the first uh, symbol times three power the second basic code, the, the basic code of the second symbols, and so forth and so on, up to pi n, which is the nth prime number power the basic code of the last symbol of that expression. So to give you an example, take this expression, negation equals zero successor zero. <clears throat> this is gonna be is gonna be encoded by a certain number, and this number will just be two power the basic code of negation times three power the basic code of identity and so forth and so on which is just two power six times three power six and so forth and so on, which is this big number if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And so this number here will be the code for that expression. And we can do that with all elements of A star. So any um, expression in our language will have a certain unique number. And because we are doing this weird kind of coding, we can actually prove using the fundamental theorem of arithmetic that, oops, sorry, that um, this Gödel numbering is actually functional and also injective. So we really have a numbering. Here. And each expression of my language will have a unique number that is the code for that expression. So now we're going to see two more strange examples of summary. And <clears throat> I don't want to spend too much time on them. So we're going to go quick and skip the details. But the first one basically allows us to encode within the numbering the set S. So take any set, uh, subset of the expression of the language, for example, the set of the sentence that is provable in certain theory, and then we're going to set up a numbering such that I can know whether something is in that set or not in that set. And by know, I just check the number of that, and the, the number of an expression. If the number is even, then my expression is in the set. And if it's odd, then my expression is not in the set. So this is a deviant numbering. And the intuition behind it is that I encode an information here, an elementship of the subset S into the coding. So another strange kind of numbering, very interesting, this one, is the self-referential numberings. And again, I won't go through the, uh, the construction of that numbering, but the main thing that you can see here is that for given expression S, so this is my expression, the code of this expression will end up to be the same number here. And so, in a sense, I encode the property, some property of self-referentiality into the coding because this number will be the code of that expression. And so, this formula that says that this number is a phi says that itself 
is a pi, because this number, again, is the product of that number. So I can encode some kind of self-referential uh, property directly into the code. And again, that's a weird, strange problem. So now that we have seen two different coding, uh, three different numberings, I want to talk about um, the role of the numbering and why exactly uh, we're doing, uh, we're working with numberings. And this is, um, so I'm, I'm basing this part on the paper by Graham a very nice uh, paper on the, the, the study of numberings. So in this paper, he's distinguishing, he's distinguishing uh, two main roles that any numbering must have. The first one is the semantic role. Okay, so a numbering allows us to represent syntactic entities and properties by number and arithmetic properties, and thereby, in the end, to interpret certain arithmetic results as being about part of a syntax. And this is again the whole purpose of the number, right? We want to prove things about numbers that we can, in the end, interpret to be about um, some syntactic aspect of the logic. So this word is crucial, and if you don't have it, if you, if you fail to be able to interpret some numbers as being uh, the name indirectly to some uh, expression, then the whole point of doing number is, uh, well, there's no point of doing number. The second role is the epistemic role. So given a certain mathematical context, think about um, the second importance theory. Given a certain language, think about language of arithmetic. Given a certain theory, think about piano arithmetic. A number ensures that reason about syntactic expression via their representation, so via number, we're going to reason about expression, requires no resources that lie outside the theory we are working on. And for theory not to exceed the theory we are working on this resource, the theory should know or verify or recognize some relevant contextually dependent C part or and C property by means of proving them. Okay. So basically, um, here, the point is that if you're working a very weak arithmetic theory that cannot prove even basic facts about the syntax, then there is no point of going on and using the numbering because it's going to require too much uh, resources uh, to basically make sense of what you're going to prove later on because your theory is too weak. So the theory cannot know anything about what it, it proves and what you want it to say. Okay, so I think those two roles of numbering are not controversial at all. And the interesting part now that I, I want to um, I want to, 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 to present is uh, Grammar's justification of those two roles for his sum of tasks of numbering that he's introducing in this paper. So <laughs> he writes, every admissible, he called them in this class, he called them admissible. Numbering induces a pair where G is a set of code and blah, 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 um, which represents the structure of expression. And he goes on, that this representation does not employ resources exceeding T, the theory, can be understood in virtue of T recognizing or knowing or verifying certain fact and property concerning this induced pair by means of proving formula which express them. So why is it particularly interesting here is that in order to justify the semantic role of the numberings he's working with, he says that this, those numberings fulfill or satisfy the semantic role because they induce a pair, a certain pair, which represent the structure of the expression. And it goes even a bit further, the numbering is actually an isomorphism between this pair and the structure of the expression. 
And the point here I want to make is that this justification is just an instance or special instance of the resemblance criterion that we saw before with respect to the digits. And so that the numbering plays the isomorphism between the syntax and the structure it in use is just a way to say that the, the numbering is an intentionally correct characterization of the syntax by mean of it resem resembles the syntax by mean of it induces a certain mathematical structure that resembles the syntax. And there you have that the certain mathematical structure it induces is in a certain relation with uh, the uh, effective uh, the, 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 the structure of the syntax. So the justification of why the numbering, those numberings are um, well, pass the, the test of uh, the semantic role, so they do uh, satisfy their semantic role, is because, is because they use some certain structure which is in relation with the structure of syntax. And the underlying justification below this is just an instance of the resemblance criterion. As for two, now you might guess where I'm going. So two is again justified through a certain understanding which is the meaning of postulates. So here, the condition that T recognizes no meaning verifies certain facts is just that T must by enumerates G and the graph of <laughs> this function. And this just means that T must prove certain facts about G and uh, circular star. And again, the just, and if the theory proves those facts, then the number, the numbering fulfill is uh, epistemic role with respect to the theory and with respect to the certain context. And again, this justification there, I take it just to be an instance of some more general principle, which is the meaning postulate principle. Okay. So now, 10 minutes, okay. So now we can finally try to sketch an answer to what is a good uh, numbering. And we saw first that the semantic role is tied to the very aim of numbering. Right? Uh, a numbering satisfies its semantic role if it uh, allows us to interpret the number as the name of expression of syntax. And uh, so it, it is very connected with why we are using numbering, basically. And the point here I want to make really um, for later is that it is the semantic role is tied to the very end of the numbering and that's it. We are not talking yet of the theory we are working in, we are not talking about the metamathematical context or what we are trying to prove. It's just tied to the very end of why we are using numberings. Whereas the epistemic role depends both on the metamathematical context and the theory. The C fact or the things that we have to prove or the theory have to prove so that the theory knows what it is doing depends completely on the context, so what we want to prove in the end, and also on the theory, whether the theory is strong enough to prove those facts. And the same, you have a nice parallelism between the semantic role and the resemblance criterion, because again, I think that, that there some kind of resemblance criterion is the justification why certain uh, numbering uh, pass the test of being adequate with respect to the symmetric world. And you can see that the resemblance criterion brings information purely and strictly only about the numbering. It is, uh, it is only, so it says that a numbering is intentionally correct if and only if the numbering resembles the syntax. And there we are not talking yet about the, con the arithmetical context of what we're trying to prove. Now we're talking about in which theory we're going to prove that. So we're just talking about the numbering and whether the numbering is somewhat resembles the syntax. As again, whereas with the meaning postulates, 
brings information, further information about the adequacy of our memory with respect to the theory and the sort of context. And as we saw, it brings, it, it, it tells us whether the theory is strong enough to use this new memory by proving some key facts about this memory. And therefore, if the theory is strong enough to reason about the syntactical properties that are encoded by the number. Okay, so as I said, I think that the resemblance criterion justifying the semantic role, at least in the case of, of uh, Balthazar's article, and that the meaning also justifying the epistemic role. And so here we have a case where both of the um, approaches to intentionality, so both the resemblance criterion and the meaning poster are necessary to give a full answer to what is uh, uh, to, to, to explain when a numbering is intentionally adequate. So what is a good numbering? We can finally give a some, somewhat of an answer. So the first answer, uh, and yeah, as many questions, we can answer the question, you know, or at least understand the question in different ways. So the first way to understand the question is by looking at the absolute uh, question and give an absolute answer with respect to the uh, resemblance criteria. And well, <laughs> picture, quick, quick. <laughs> And so the absolute answer to this question is, as we saw, the using the resemblance criterion. So a good numbering is just a numbering that resembles the syntax. And we saw that I think the right analysis to resemble the syntax is that the numbering induces a certain structure that is in certain relation with the syntax. Then we can give a somewhat relative answer, again, only with respect to this resemblance principle. And this answer will not be an answer to the question, what is a good numbering to prove? But it's gonna be an answer to the question, what is a good numbering with respect to certain uh, syntactical properties? And so here, well, the numbering has to resemble those certain syntactical properties. It doesn't have to resemble the whole syntax. So if we, I care only about negation in the syntax, well, the numbering just has to resembles how negation behaves in the syntax. Or if I care only about formula or proof that uh, have less than 1,000 symbols, well, the numbering just have to get correct the proofs that have less than 1,000 uh, symbols. And so the syntax that has to do with proofs that have, that have less than 1,000 symbols. And then we have, again, another relative answer. And this time res with respect to both the resemblance criterion and the meaning postulate, and it is what is it is the answer to what is a good numbering to prove Gödel's incompleteness, or what is a good numbering to do a certain thing to prove a certain theorem. And there, the answer depends on what you want to prove, in which theory you want to prove it. And if you have those two, well, you need to prove the numbering to fulfill both role, and again to respect so the. Uh, both uh, approach of intentionality. So the numbering has to represent or resembles certain C aspects of the syntax, so the aspects that are relevant in what, what you want to prove. And T, so the theory, has to recognize those C facts and C properties. So again, if you want to prove that, uh, well, if you want to prove Gödel's uh, second incompetence theorem, I guess the whole syntax is relevant. So you need to have a very strong uh, um, link between the number and the, the syntax. But if you want to prove a minor results about negation, for example, well, you might, you, you might be allowed to use just a number in that gets right how negation behaves and wrong the rest. Doesn't really matter. So, I think I'm running late. We need to get Okay, okay. So 
is there any good in our numberings? So the three different kinds of numberings I, I show you. And well, not to, to, to be a bit quick, I will just talk about the first one. Well, the first one is the standard numbering. So we kind of assume, and it is quite convincing uh, to say that, well, it passed the test of the resemblance criterion. It does indeed resembles the syntax correctly. And it also passed the test of the linear postulates. We can do, um, well, sorry, it passed the test of the meaning postulate with respect to Gödel's phenomenon theorem and the theory of piano arithmetic. If you use a weaker theory like Robinson arithmetic, for example, it passed for sure the test of the resemblance criterion, but it does not pass the test of the meaning postulate because the theory is so good that it's not going to be able to prove any facts about its syntax, and it's not going to be able to even use the number in the in a, in, a, in a decent way. Um, okay, so let me jump to the fourth uh, line, which, uh, which is the self-referential numbering. So you see the numbering which uh, encode the notion of self-referential, uh, of self-reference in, in, in itself, basically. And why is it important? Is that actually the answer to the first, uh, to the first uh, slides, whether the layer paradox, the formalization of the layer paradox is consistent, or the theory when we, that we build is consistent or inconsistent, depends, I, I told you, on which number we are using. And if you are using a self referential number, you get an inconsistency. But if you are using the standard number, you get a consistent theory. So there you have two different numbers that gives you different results with respect to uh, the layer paradox. And what is extremely interesting about the self referential numbering is that we can build it in some way that most likely it's going to pass all meaning possibilities. Whatever you can think of, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pass there. And that's basically just because you can have a recursive translation between the first number and the, the self referential number. So, with respect to the theory PA, at least, those two numberings are somewhat equivalent. I can check it proves that. So here you have a problem if you're only working with meaning positive because you have two different numberings that both most likely will satisfy any condition you put on the meaning positive. And that gives you different results. So you need the meaning positive, but you also need the resemblance material. And the very basic condition that we have is that the self-referential numbering does not satisfy the resemblance criterion because it's just a trick. Basically, we encode self-referential, some self-referential property into the numbering, and that's not how we build syntax. Syntax is not like this. So at some point, along the way, it fails to resemble um, the syntax. And well, so far, there is no good account of which um, of the, the, the resemblance criterion that gets yeah. right those intuition that say, well, the standard number is uh, those resembles the syntax and the self-referential number does not resemble the syntax. So to conclude, I briefly show you the, explain briefly the phenomenon of intentionality in later mathematics. And I stress that it is important both in mathematics for its generalization and intuition of those well-known results, but also in philosophy, if you want to use the philosophical interpretation of those results in any philosophical arguments. Then I argue that the resemblance criterion and the meaning postulates, so the two approaches that deal with intentionality in the literature, are at least in the case of numbers, and I would be tempted to say for all the uh, things that are going that we want to be intentionally correct. So those two approaches are complementary and not opposites, as it is often uh, thought in the literature. And finally, a good numbering, I answer in an absolute way, that a good numbering is one that induces a structure that resembles the syntax in the relevant way. And here, the resemblance can be precise by saying that the numbering actually acts out as an isomorphic between the, the structure it induced and the syntax, the structure of the syntax. Of course, the whole difficulty and the rest of the research 
that has to be done is what is the relevant way. Because right now we don't have yet uh, a strong enough criterion to, uh, to determine whether this number is a good one or not. And, uh, and yeah, so the rest of the research has to, to be to impose some further condition on what is and which structure that a certain number num, uh, number induce uh, have in common with the syntax and what are those conditions. And that's what uh, I'm working on right now. All right, thanks a lot.